Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce today uh, Nick Lesberg, Lesberg um, uh, who will be talking about what we actually know about our Australia's rarest birds. Uh, Nick has a really interesting background in that this is um, uh, at least at, the, at a minimum part two of his life. I've been spending um, uh, 15 years in the Air Force, um, but as he writes in his profile, uh, he's finally found where he needed to be, which is great. Um, I was you were on to be, I just had to work out how to get there. It's, it's a common story in my experience. <laughs> um, and uh, what I am really excited to hear about his work is that, um, at least in the world that I'm familiar with, the kind of research that he does has been traditionally very well rewarded in universities. Um, and I think it should be because I think it's really probably more important than the vast amount of research that he's done um, under the banner of ecology, biology, evolutionary biology. Um, and so with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, folks. Thanks for coming to indulge in my favourite pastime, which is banging on about night parrots and birds generally. So um, I'm going to start. Um, obviously, um, so I'm just my name's Nick. Um, I do a, I have a few different jobs. I do a couple of days a week with um, the acute postdoctoral work with uh, James Watson, mainly in the Rares group, which is research and recovery of endangered species. We focus mainly on birds. Um, I also do a couple of days a week in Heritage Australia as an ecology uh, an ecologist for one of their uh, reserves in Western Queensland, where which is where we do all the night power research, which I'll, I'll talk about in a sec. And I also do a little bit of consulting on the side, so I have a, a an interesting mix of work. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about a little bit of a you know in the parlance is called an arousal, where I try and get you all interested in what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the work I'm doing at um, Pullen Pawn at the moment. So, does anyone, uh, Pullen Pawn is sort of out in southwest or far western Queensland, just near Winton. I don't know if you know western Queensland at all. Um, arid zone, it's in the Channel Country, the Diamantina River, which is one of the main rivers that runs down into, uh, ends up running into like Lake Eyre and that, is uh, runs down one side of one boundary of the reserve. And as if you've been paying attention to the weather patterns over the last few years, you'll know that out, yeah, out there they've had three huge years, lots of rain, you know, more, you know. It's uh, like, kind of seems to come around like a 10 to 15 year cycle. You get these big, you know, sort of these few good years in a row and we're experiencing one at the moment. The animal at the top left here is called a long-haired rat. Now these go through in, um, uh, correlating with these big years, these rats go through booms. And I always, I've always read about them as a kid. I heard about these long-haired rat booms when I started working out there. I really wanted to see one. And we had a couple of wet years. And I thought maybe this will be the year and it didn't happen. But finally this year, the end of last year and this year it's happened and it's incredible. I, I took a little video for my kid, which I sent home to my kids while I was out on a field trip. And in about a three minute driving stretch, there was like 30 or 40 rats running across the road in these little stretches that you drop. This is just in the middle of nowhere. So the things are literally everywhere. Now, they're there at low levels all the time, but the numbers obviously explode. We know they're at low levels all the time because Steve Kearney, another UQ, um, did his PhD finish here a couple of years ago. He did some analysis of owl pellets, which again, owls are always out there. And through the owl pellets, we know the long-haired rats are there because they we find them in the pellets, but at the moment they're everywhere. Now, obviously the problem with a rat plague is you have a cat plague following soon behind. And we have a, um, so one of the things we've been doing to try and uh, so mitigate against that is have lots of cat controllers going on this year. We've got professional cat shooters go out there and then we've had um, folks out there for about sort of three months in total over already this year, just trying to keep constant pressure on the cat on the cats because we know cats are one of the primary threats to the night parrots. Um, sorry, I, I did mean to say with the rat plague comes an owl plague as well. Owls always out there in low numbers right now. It looks like it's like breakfast time at Hogwarts. There's owls everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so these, this was taken at about 8 o'clock, uh, 7.38, like only half an hour after dusk, and they just didn't move. They've probably already caught a rat, ate it, and, you know, fat, dumb and happy after only being awake for half an hour. Um, so that's the, uh, like I said, the, to put the numbers in perspective, our cat guys go out and do, usually do like a two to three week trip. And in a two to three week trip on pawn pawn trapping and shooting, they might, um, might sort of get about 12 cats. The last two two week trips have got 56 and 53 cats respectively. So, and that's in, you know, those, those trips were only months apart. So that's, that gives you a sense of the, like I said, the, the explosion that happens with the, with the rats. And 
on the last trip, um, a lot of them they trap, but when they shoot them, I think of the 15 or so cats they shot, 12 of them had a rat with them at the time when it was shot. So it so just gives you an idea of what's happening. Um, it's not all bad news for the night parrots. So um, what I'm about to show you is, as far as I know, the only video that exists in the universe of a night parrot in its natural habitat. This was our uh, our cat shooter was driving along and spotted the bird off the side of the road. I, in, in my eight years of working out there, I've seen night parrots away from the spots where we know they roost and breed on like two or three occasions. And it's usually just off they go. So this guy actually got a video and I'll show it to you. It's pretty cool. Is right there in the middle. Oh, yeah, so that, like I said, the only video in existence of a night parrot in the wild behaving naturally. Um, this is a problem for the night parrot. So there's a paper, I think it was like 2006, by Chris Dickman that talked about how, um, how prey responds to novel predators. And the night parrot is a good example. So there's there's sort of three categories he, he, he thinks where there's category one, where they just don't recognize it as a predator and the thing and they get munched. There's a category where they recognize it as a predator, but they adopt the, the wrong response to the threat. So, and that's why night parrots we think are so vulnerable to cats, because this is what they do when they get frightened. They often, they sit there and they hunch, they'd be really still. And if you're a cat, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll grab you. But if you're, if you're an owl, I can understand that might work for a barn owl flying over the top or something like a freeze. The barn owl doesn't see me. I'm not making any noise. Probably I'll get away with it. But for cats, bad response. And then category three is they recognise it as a, as, a, as a threat. They adopt the right response, but it's not quite good enough. Like they try and fly away, but the cat's too fast or something like that. So night parrots think firmly in uh, category two there. And that's why they um, that's why they get much by cats. So. But I'm not here to talk about night parrot ecology. I'm here to talk about what we know about some of Australia's rarest birds. Um, we work with lots of different people in the rares lab. There's just some of the some of our partners down there. Um, and what I'm going to talk about, just to, I'm going to give a little intro into Australia's birds and what we know. I'm going to talk about our first project, which was my PhD and the night parrot, and how that sort of you know some of the some of the things we found out about that, and how that's influenced some of the other pro, other projects that we worked on. And I'll talk about buffies, buff breasted button quail, and red goshawks. Then I'll talk about maybe what's going on, some of the problems that we've discovered working on these projects and how we can avoid some of those problems, which I'll, like I said, hopefully I'll illustrate. Um, so Australia's birth generally, and I want to thank Lewis, who's sitting here, right here, for some of this data, which we pulled out of a paper that he's led um, in the last few weeks. Australia's birds, you'd think, relatively well documented. So there's about 42 million records across the two major citizen science databases in Australia, which is eBird. If anyone who's got bird watching, you know, eBird is banging your sightings into your phone. And there's another one called Bird, uh, which was managed by BirdLife and was big about 10 years ago, but is sort of being maybe being squeezed out a bit by eBird. And there's records of every presumed extant land bird in that database. Now, the number of records in there varies wildly. So you can see for you know magpie, that's the top 10 most recorded birds. You know, more than a million records of magpie across you know yeah, across those two databases. Down the bottom, there's a bird called Coxon's Fig Parrot, which has only got four records of it. And another one called Buff Breasted Buck the second bottom, which has got seven records. And I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, that's one of the birds that um, we're going to talk about. But some of those species are, actually make sense. See red cap flower pecker and singing starling, um, Christmas island boo they're they're like small island birds. People don't get there that much. So it makes sense that they're not recorded. But I want you to you know, just think about what those numbers might tell you, like why some species might have might have fewer records and the other what that might tell us. Generally, our survey, um, our sort of 
the spread of our surveys in Australia is interesting, and it's sort of it's not really surprising. And you can see that there. That this is a wrap of checklist um, density. So you know how many hundred, you know, how many thousands of checklists or a log scale down the bottom there. Obviously, around our capital cities, lots of surveys. Yeast and seaboard generally fairly well surveyed, but all these blue areas in the middle where there's no surveys at all. No one's ever been in there to look for birds. And about one quarter of Australia has no survey effort. And then just something to keep in the background, about one in six species is threatened. That depends on how you break down when you define a species, subspecies, all this sort of stuff. And this is the breakdown here. About 20 of them are critically endangered, about 80 to 90 endangered or vulnerable, and about 35 near threatened. So just keep, like I said, that's just some numbers to keep in the back of your head when we when, when we talk about what some of the problems might be later on. All right, so that's it. So like I said, what I want you to take away from that is you would be forgiven for thinking that birds are, you know, they're everywhere, people see them, there's lots of bird watchers. We think there's a fair bit of data about which we can use to make decisions. So I'm gonna talk now about the first project that we did, which is my PhD, and that was on the night parrot. So a bit of a part of history of the night parrot, first seen by Europeans in 1845, um, was reported reasonably often until the late 20th century. And we think at some sites it was actually probably fairly common. So there's about 29 skins of night parrots in, uh, you know, in museums across the world. And we think about 25 to 26 of them were collected by one person in about a, in probably in a one to two year period at one site in South Australia. So at, at times they were obviously fairly, you know, fairly common. There's a, a good story that you can dig up in the historical literature about an expedition that was going through the center of Australia and got to Alice Springs and by the time it got there, which was about the 1890s, night parrots had started to disappear from the southern parts of their range. And the bird, the ornithologist on the expedition walked into the postmaster's office and on, on a picture on the wall, he had some like night parrot wings hanging on it. And he's like, hey, where did these come from? Yeah, it's night parrots, this is really rare. And I was like, oh, the cat brings them in all the time. <laughs> so, the, so that's where, so at times these things were, you know, were relatively common. But the decline was first noted around 1880 in the southern parts of its range, and by the sort of so early 1900s, it spread right across its range to Western Australia. And the last confirmed sighting was from Western Australia in 1912. I've got confirmed in inverted brackets there because anyone who's done any work around sighting records and what's confirmed and what's not what's not confirmed, you realise pretty quickly when you get into it that it's a it's a really woolly <laughs> term that doesn't actually doesn't mean anything and its meaning has probably actually changed over time so you know i'd classify that as a confirmed sighting because i can I've got hard evidence that it once existed okay and i've got the label that says where it was caught and stuff but in the old days you could get a confirmed sighting just by taking really good notes on your on the sighting and describing it well and you know leaving people in no doubt that that's the bird that you saw these days you it's hard, hard to get a confirmed sighting without a digital photograph of it so I want to think about how that's, like I said, how that has changed over time, what you, what we consider a good sighting of a species, because that became a problem with the night parrot. So the last confirmed sighting was 1912. There was rumours, oh, the night parrot's extinct. Is it gone? Is it, no, no, it's out there somewhere. And But there was no, again, no confirmed sightings, no hard proof until 1990 when a dead bird was found near Bullion in Western Queensland. The story of how this bird got found is amazing. Uh, and just think about, you know, we were working probabilities. Think about the probabilities of this actually happening. There was there was an expedition from the Australian Museum. They were collecting birds, I think, over in Western Australia or something, and they were driving back through central Queensland. And there was two um, uh, Walter Bowles and I forget the other guy's name. You? No. Walter Bowles and... <clears throat> Might, might be a dick shoddy anyway. And they had an, an American guy with them and, and they stopped to pull up to show the American guy this bird called Australian Pratt and Cole, which is like a little plover sort of thing. And they're in two cars and one of them got out of the back car and walked up the front and was like leaning in the window to say, see over there's the Australian Pratt. And he looked down and at his feet was the dead night parrot. Like not only did they stop, you know, the millions of kilometres of road in Australia, they stopped at the spot where the dead night parrot was. But the person who saw it was one of probably 50 people on the planet who would have known what he was, that that you know, decrepit old thing was a night parrot. So that's just the, the chance of that happening to blow me away. And a friend of mine, Steve Murphy, on the back of that, rode his bike around Western Queensland for about three weeks, thinking that if he can find one, they've got to be in somewhere. <laughs> it's quite surprising he didn't find any. So 1990, we still couldn't find a live one until 2006, another dead one was found. That's the one over there. It was found below a fence in Diamantina National Park. By that stage, people, you know, because of the one in 1990, people thought, oh, maybe these things are out there somewhere. 
The guy who found that was just a parky, just doing a fence line run, grading a fence, and he saw it, realized it was different, didn't know what it was, really, you know, was smart enough to realize oh, I haven't seen that one before and took it to someone who was able to work out what it was. <laughs> Finally, though, in 2013, it was literally the front page of the Australian. A fellow called John Young found them at a site in Western Queensland, took a photograph. Um, like I said, that, that photograph was the front page of the Australian. It was international news, this bird, you know, back from the dead, you know, presumed extinct. A lot of people say it was presumed extinct. I'll show you in a sec why it actually shouldn't have been. Out of that spurned a bit of research effort, which uh, then morphed into my PhD, and I spent my time mainly working out how to find night parrots. So we knew where they were. We needed to work out how do you find out if they're in other places. I did a lot of work with um, on bioacoustic recorders up in the top right there. Um, got to see and photograph a night parrot a few times. That's a young one in a nest down the bottom. So built quite a lot of, you know, we built a fair bit of ecological knowledge about the species, like what it actually, you know, what resources it uses, you know, its biology, all these things which end up being quite important. Um, what I was trying to work out largely was if I have this area of habitat and I have one of those recorders, how many of them do I need to put out? That was the sort of the, that was the, I guess, the meat of my PhD, trying to work that out. And really pleasingly, I got some good results and we've now, uh, a lot of the knowledge I learned my PhD has actually been, the main people who employ it is environmental consultants who need to find out if there's night parrots in their projects, but also um, a lot of indigenous ranger groups in Western Australia, because we've found rain, uh, night parrots in Queensland, but the main game in, for night parrots is Western Australia. And a lot of those indigenous ranger groups have been over there and trained them and that sort of thing, how to use these ARUs, and they're now finding there's, we're up to about, so it started in 2013 with that one spot. We're up to about 12 spots now where night parrots have been found, and about seven of those have been found by Indigenous rangers employing these, so you know, using ARUs, using the techniques that we developed on PhD. So that's been a really, um, really eye-opening for me. It's been great. But it's not much good knowing how to look for night parrots unless you sort of know where to go and look. And so one of the things I did do as part of my PhD was start to look back through the historical record of night parrots. And this is the, um, so what I did was I, I was I was helped by this. I had some people that doing the work before me and started to compile a database of all the night parrot sightings that we could find in literature, gray literature, personal communications, and all this sort of data. And if you plot them out, they look like that, you know, right through Central Australia. But what we did is we then tried to assess them for their veracity. And this is where I get to the, um, this is where we get to that issue I was talking about around what's a confirmed record and what's a not a confirmed record. So the the sort of, you know, the orthodoxy was that this thing disappeared in 1912 because there was this confirmed sighting, but it turns out the confirmed sighting was just a really good description of one that had been shot, but not prepared very well. So they, you know, yeah, we're pretty sure that's a night parrot. But then for, you know, until 1990, it was that 80 years basically without a sighting. And if you talk about you're actually having a skin, you know, something you can hold in your hand, it's more than 100 years between sightings. So we delved right into these sightings, got the details, and it sort of did like an expert analysis, I suppose, knowing, you know, what the what did they describe seeing? Is it like it would have been a night parrot? And found some really interesting trends, I suppose. So the first is that the idea that night parrots are extinct and that no one had seen them is a bit of a myth. They're actually out there the whole time and because and there are some really good reports of them. So, for example, a farmer in the central northern, in, 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 sort of southern northern territory there in about 1950 was riding his horse through the spinifex and a green parrot popped out and flew away croaking like a frog. That can only be one thing. The only possible explanation for that is that he saw a night parrot, but that's not a confirmed sighting. So he's only a farmer. Okay. So, and this is this sort of pattern was repeated that as time went on, the bar to get a you know a confirmed sighting of a night parrot just got higher and higher and higher and higher until eventually the only thing they would accept was a dead one found by the side of the road. But when you look at these sightings, actually they're out there and they're being seen by people. And we get a trend over time. So this is high veracity records from 1970 onwards. And then if you do the same thing from 2000 onwards, you can see this retraction into these sort of, you know, into these sort of two key areas. And this is where all our sightings are now. This is just using historical stuff. It's working out that where we're finding them now is where that historical trend tells us. So we thought, so what was interesting there was that we could dive back into this historical record and still pull some really interesting information out of it. It's been there in front of us the whole time, telling us where to look for night parrots. We just haven't done the work really. So that was one, that was, like I said, that was just one chapter of my PhD, but some really interesting lessons that come out of it. So when we moved on to our next couple of species, 
end up end going through the same thing. So I want to talk about our second project we started the lab was a called uh, searching for Buffy. Now Buffy is the buff breasted button quail. Um, you know, button quails, if you don't know them, you know, this big a quail, they live on the ground, but in sort of um, open woodland up on Cape York. Now, this is a curious piece to pick because it had never been photographed. It was the, at the time, um, it was the only Australian land bird, I think, that's ever been photographed. Um, and the orthodoxy was there's an excellent population of them on the northern African tableland. They're a bit hit and miss, but if you can't put them yet, you'll see them. And, we're, and we thought, okay, sound, sounds good. Everyone knows where to see them. We'll go up there, we'll find them, we'll work out why there's so few, we'll work out are they still up on the Cape? Is this because it was classified as endangered? And we would you know work out what the threats were, we'd point you this sort of information. So that was the that was the idea at the start. And this work was all done by a fellow called Pat Webster, who's still going, he's very close to finishing his PhD. Even though, as it turns out, we never saw a buff breasted button file. That still hasn't seen one. So the started off with three years of searches at the known sites. And again, I want you to talk back to the anecdote. This is where people, these were confirmed sightings. Is yeah, no, this is where you go and see buff breasted button file. You park your car here, you walk in 100 meters there, you walk around it, it's there, trust me. So he did all these things. He looked up all the old records, went to all the old sites. He didn't find any buff breasted button file. What he did find was lots of painted button quail, and that's this bird down at the bottom here. And he also got a range extension into Queensland, the first um, record for Queensland of the bird at the top called the chestnut bat button quail, which is the buffy's closest relative. And the buff breast of button quail probably looks something like that when it's alive. So again, perhaps thought, all right, Nick's done this with night parrots, I'm going to do it with buffies. I'm going to go back and review all the buffy sightings. And again, like I said, we had the opposite problem. Instead of with night parrots, where everyone's like, no, nah, that's not a night parrot unless I see it in my hand. Buffy's was the opposite. It was like, yeah, no, that, that's a buffy. It's close enough. And what happened is over time, people, people, they basically made up these field marks for seeing this thing. They came up, they said, you know it's a buffy because it's heaps bigger than painted buffy. You see lots of buffy, they're small. This buffy, it's, it's big. It's like the size of a squatter pigeon. If you know a squatter pigeon, they might be. So what did Pat do? He's like, now this seems really weird. He went back to the museum. He measured all the, you know, the seven skins of Buffy that exist, all the skins of painted button pile that he could find. And what did he work out? They're the same. They're no different. So why were people saying that this thing seems bigger? There's no, no basis in fact for that claim. The other thing that he thought was really weird, and now <laughs> bird watcher, Lewis, you can't answer this question. What's the thing, look at those two birds. What's the thing that stands out about the top one? What did you hear someone say about thing? Yeah, it's got this stonking bright yellow eye in its head and these bright yellow feet. No one that saw Buffy's ever said, yeah, no, I thought I saw this thing with a big yellow eye and yellow feet. They just saw, oh, it's this sandy colored bird. I've got a brief view as it flew away. So this, again, as Pat looked into the sightings, the opposite problem. People are saying they've seen this thing and they haven't. And now, it's five years into his PhD, we still haven't found the Buffy. He's gone back into all the historical sightings and worked out. Actually, the last time this thing was seen was 1922. So what they were saying about the night parrot was wrong about the night parrot, but actually right about the Buffy. So why, you know, well, how has that problem occurred? It's back to the same problem with the night parrot. It's the reliance on anecdotal sightings, the reliance on, you know, it, you know this, this person told me that that's where I can see the thing. Another species which we work on now where we're having similar problems, although to be fair, not quite as bad, is the, um, sorry, yeah, that's an explanation there too, is the red goxal. So this work's being done by another PhD student, PhD student in the lab called Chris McCole. Now, big red, the red goxal, it's probably Australia's rarest raptor. It's a resident, so we thought, in the tropical woodlands across northern Australia. So from the Kimberley across to Cape York and then some ways down the east coast, there are historical records of it. Chris has done some great work. He's gone and caught, um, I think he does like 12, 15 birds now, caught them and put these tag. You can see this bird here, it's got a little tag on the back there. Uh, it's a solar, solar powered thing. So it puts, it puts on the bird. And we've had some of them, some of them are still going up like three years, where we can literally just get dots on the map every day of where this bird is. Um, true story someone once asked me why you can't put a solar tag on a night parrot. <laughs> <laughs> So that's uh, so that's what his uh, that's what his work is doing, and we thought, you know, this would you know, we would work out, you know, we would get some sort of fine scale tracking information about this bird because we thought we thought habitat clearing might be a significant issue for it. 
Um, a lot of, for example, the reason a lot of the funding for Chris's project came from Rio Tinto because of the red goshawk's nest around there, big bauxite up mining operation up in Arakoon on the west coast of Cape York. So it was offset for them. That's where a lot of money came from. So we wanted, we thought, you know, what's that clearing doing to red goshawks? Is that affecting their foraging patterns? Is that what's driving the decline? He also caught some birds in the Northern Territory and found out not all, not the entire population, but especially young birds and about half the adult population we've tracked so far are doing these massive sort of semi-migrations across Australia. This is a young bird tagged up near Darwin that actually ended up dying down in the middle of the Pilbara. And this area, this is all arid. If you told us, if you told someone three or four years ago, that you, um, you know, that red goshawks spend a lot of their time in the arid zone, you just would have been laughed away. You know, that's ridiculous. It can't, it can't be true. You know, that's not what happens. We've had birds from Cape York spend time down here in southeastern Northern Territory and over it's near, very close to where I do some of my night parrot research, which is again mind blowing. And all these young birds are doing this, which is what's really interesting. So, you know, we thought habitat clearing was a threat in the Cape, and it may still be. But we these birds spending half their lives in areas we didn't even know. So what are the threats out here? Are the young birds being affected by something out in the some change in the arid zone that we haven't even been awake to with this species? That was the sort of takeaway from that. Again, relying on what we think we know versus doing the research and working out what we you know what we need to know. So that's big reds. And another thing that, because um, we've established a bit of a trend of doing this now, we went back and looked at all the historical records. And this is another worrying thing we found out for red goshawk. This is records of the red goss from the 1980s. And you can see in the 1980s, there was you know, fairly regular sightings in this area of southeast Queensland, northeast New South Wales. But over the last few decades, almost completely disappeared. So these two records that remain are from like 2011 and 2012. So for the last, about the last 10 years, no records of that species, basically along the eastern seaboard. Now, you can interpret that a few ways. It could be that this part of, you know, this part of their range was then a port, port of the a small part of the population. But certainly there is a, but they're certainly, you can say they have disappeared from a significant level of their range, you know, up to this sort of looking at you know, almost a third of their range. There. Like I said, may, may not have been particularly important. Well, the Northern Australia has probably always been the most important area for them. But there's no doubt that this has happened, and so we've been late for it. No one's talked about it, no one's mentioned it, no one you know, writes about it in any papers, you know, any papers on the birds. So it's just, like I said, just another, thing, another example of us thinking that we knew what to do. <laughs> But perhaps not having this good idea of the one. So the obvious question is, you know, what's going on? Why are we why are we you know scratching the surface on these species and finding information that's so you know so different to what we thought we know? And the truth is, much of our knowledge on birds is anecdotal. It's often collected for some species, it's collected by one or two people, and that's disseminated, and that becomes you know anchoring groupthink, all these sorts of things which are which are real risks for you in this sort of um, in this sort of environment, I suppose. Um, if you're interested in the risks of using anecdotal uh, evidence, I'd highly recommend you jump into that paper there, and probably in 2008, which used there's three examples of three North American mammals um, Wolverine, uh, Mark, Mark, it's like some sort of river, river Mark, is that? White Mark. Uh, White Mark, sorry. Stone Mark. Uh, it, was, it, was it was a sort Fisher. of a, a Fisher, Fisher, Fisher was the one, and, then, and another one which I can't remember about how the idea of the population of these species was destroyed as soon as anyone started looking into the actual science of it because it was all based on anecdotal evidence. So like I said, a real risk. Now I do want to be clear, for some species, these anecdotal records do cloud the real picture. Okay, we might have a the red or probably some of them. But then there's some where the anecdotal evidence is probably about right. We probably do have a good idea of Species doing, but I don't say, well, I'm not saying let's throw all the you know, sort of baby out of the bathwater, but we've just got to be careful with how we use that information. Um, then, you know, how do we avoid the future mistakes? Yeah, how, how do we avoid the problem of having the knife? Right, well, you know, and knowledge can only be as good as the foundation supporting it, so we need to interrogate that knowledge, and that's the hard thing. It's like, how do we know, you know, what is it about these species that? makes me think, well, this is one where we need to do this deep dive into the historical information, or this is one where we think it's about right. 
And this is what we've a bit of work that Lewis has been doing in the last few weeks has sort of looked at this using going back to those eBird records that I talked about at the start. So a classic example is Coxon's Fig Parrot. No photo of the lights of Coxon's Fig Parrot exists. That's one from the Queensland Museum. There's only four records of Coxon's Fig Parrot in um, in in any of the citizen science databases. Yes, its range is in the red bit. It's, there are 100,000 checklists for the range of the, the Fox and Sioux Parrot, yet we've got no records on it. It's only critically endangered. People aren't worried about it. They think it's still out there. And this is a species that probably deserves one of these deep dives. Another one is the leadwing kite, which is a species found in, again, out in the yards. They boom on the back of these long head rat eruptions that I was talking about before. Uh, this is a species which ranges primarily in all those blue squares where there hasn't been much, yeah, you know, where there hasn't been a lot of survey effort. It's something we don't know a lot about its ecology. It's one of these real boom bust species, and we don't know what causes them to you know, breed, what causes them to die off. We think we know, but have we got that right? Is that yeah, because like I said it occurs in one of these areas where we don't know much about it? So that's another species that we that we think you know is worth being concerned about. They're just classified as vulnerable at the moment, but some preliminary work we're doing is showing again these clear contractions of record at a time. The other thing, and this goes to like, I hope the point that Simon was making before, is that for a lot of these species, natural history is actually still really important. Like we couldn't, um, you know, it's great to have all these trends and records and that sort of thing, but you actually can't work out what's going on with these species unless you do that natural history, unless you, you know, know what they eat, you know what their threats are, you know how to, you know how to manage them. You can't recover any of these species unless you have that natural, like natural history knowledge. Which, like I said, it's something I think, I don't want to say it gets forgotten, I think people think that natural history is all being done. But I think what these projects show is actually there's still quite a lot of natural history to be done to make sure we're doing a good job <laughs> with the stuff we built the back end around creating management plans, knowing how to plan it out, you know, preventing error estate, all those things. Do that well, you need to have good information coming in the bottom, which, like I said, why I think natural history is still important. Um, I'll talk really quickly there for a long time. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Super great presentation. Love all the good bird pictures. Um, with the the rares group generally, there's the, obviously these different birds have these different life history traits. Are you guys working on developing different detection methods for different species and comparing them between species within populations of the species? Yeah, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do like the twenty species. So the way the way you detect a uh, where you detect a night parrot, for example, you know, the acoustic recorders is that that works for night parrots. It probably will work for buffies when we end up finding them. It might work for carpentering grass fans, which is another bird we're, we're working on. It's still quite good for a gospel. So, so you can't, it's difficult to compare the detection methods across species. What we found though is that one of the really, when I talk about natural, as well as natural history, one of the key things you have to work out for species if you want to research and research properly. Is find that bespoke um, survey data because for some of these rare species, it's you survey for this species in this exact way. And one of the chapters on my, my PhD was about if you're going to go survey for this is exactly how you do it. And this is the only way that, not the only way that you do it, but this is the way that you sort of have to deal with the species. So it's, um, so yeah, it does make it difficult to compare across, you know, how you can do, how you do surveys, but like I I, I and so whenever we take on a new species, one of the first things we look at how how we can better protect the species in a robust and at scale. Anyone else? You, you, so. so Diana Fisher has a nice paper. Maybe some of you know Diana may be in the machine listening. <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, where she looked through all the mammal staff and tried to Get, did the museum record analysis, yeah. and there's a method where you can then calculate the probability the species still exists, yeah. even though you think it's like so. The thylacine is like one yeah. in a billion that yeah. still exists based on the sequencing of records from museum yeah. and things. So I don't know, I wonder if it'd be interesting to redo that for some of the birds. statistical thing. Yeah, yeah, so that's interesting. So, some of the we did look into doing that with some of this data, yeah. but it gets it gets difficult because often what we're doing is not looking at 
we're not looking at the probability of extinction. So maybe for Bucky we might be, but for Night Parrot, it became pretty clear as soon as you're looking at the records, these things are out there somewhere. How do we, you know, how do we, what, how do we, you know, manipulate this database to tell to tell us where to look? And that's where we came up. You know, that it's clear that it shrinks in these two areas for Night Parrot. Those those um, techniques though would be useful for some of this analysis when you're looking at local extinctions, perhaps. So you can break. It's pretty clear with some species that, and night parrots is a great example. So formerly found in northeastern South Australia and sort of Kungi Lakes area, and I'm going to be familiar with that sort of area in the country. But we've tried, we've applied all these new fangled methods, and we can't find them. And so maybe that's a that's a area where we would look to use that sort of analysis at a local level to see if there's been an extinction. But for some of these species, like I said, as soon as you look into it, you realize, oh, hang on, this thing has been around for a while. Or converse with Buffy, you, you realize actually this is clear this thing hasn't been around before the records that we're based on are dodgy and, and, and practically useless in using any of that sort of any of that sort of analysis. The thing with Buffy that's really hard though is that all those records that we discounted, some of them are by Australia's top level. You know, these are the people whose reputations don't, you know, they don't like having their reputation sullied by the claim that they're stringers. You know, they're going to be birders, but you know, being a stringer is the worst thing you can be. So it's uh yeah, you know, it's 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 difficult. And uh, and in our lab, there's differing, you know, there's a gradient of confidence, I suppose. Um Pat, the guy who's done, you know, who's walked 700 times is like Never there. <laughs> Whereas I, I'm a bit more like, oh, that's a lot of people said they saw them for us to just throw it out. You know, it's 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 a it's a really interesting sort of confidence stream, I suppose. Yeah, I think segueing into that, do, do you think like should be like a method to accommodate the charisma of the species or like you know the value of the species yeah. has because people again want to see uh, what they want. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. So Buffy is a good example of that because it's a it's a you know, range of street endemic. So people that want to get big bird list, they have to go there to see it and they book a trip to go there and I've got this my three days of the year, I've got to get buffy or the guy over there gets heavy. So I'm gonna find this thing, you know. And I, I think that absolutely plays into it. I think there's a I think there's a risk that people see what they want to see. And they got told that if you see the butterfly that's bigger and it's this colour, then that it's, you've seen the right one. Don't worry about the yellow eye. The same thing should really stand at something that doesn't really matter. Just look at the big butterfly. And so butterfly are sexually dimorphic. So the females are quite a bit smaller, sorry, males are quite a bit smaller than females. And what Pat worked out was that over time these things go through the females go through a molt where in the breeding season they become almost a different, a completely different colour. So the painted butterfly generally is sort of chestnut grey, but the females in the wet season become this overall chestnut colour. And buff breasted butterfly is supposed to be the you know the field marking that's the that's clue is that it's an overall one colour. Guess when all the records of buff breasted butterfly happen? In the wet season, when the female painted butterflies come into this you know, one color thing, so and they're bigger than the males, so I go, you know, it's completely plausible. What's happening is these people looking for puppies see a male painted butterfly, go, oh, that's a really great chestnut one. Then this all chestnut one, the bigger flies up. I've seen it. That's I've seen the difference. This is what people tell me to see, tell me to look for different color, bigger. That's my bunny. It doesn't. You know, the fact that no one's photographed it, that no one's ever seen it on the ground long enough to see the yellow eye, all these things, we can explain that away. It's a bigger one. <laughs> Anyway, any other questions? Yes, we go. So, do you think they're extinct? Buffy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, look, I, I don't really know. It's, it's um, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I think there's a chance they are. But the thing you've got to remember with buffies is that they, the Athen Cave Lane thing is weird because it's actually quite disjunct from where we know they used to So all the all the specimens that we the photos of there came from Cullen, which is something like the central cave right under the very very super cave. There's no um, the records from the Athen Cave Lane all occurred relatively late from the 1980s onward. And I think there was this group mark, it's where I go to see this bird as a sort of you know it's generated one its own. That's done a lot of looking on Cape York, but there's still areas of Cape York that are relatively untouched where it hasn't looked, and they and they could be there. We just haven't been in that thing. But we also know about Cape York that there's a lot of um, a lot of environmental change that has happened up there. Change fire regime, really thickly. You know, you have to go to 
you know, examples like uh, you know, golden shot of parrots, um, squatter pigeons up there, these species which are you know, have, have, have had huge declines on the age It's quite these what buffies are all wrapped up in that, but they are they might be gone. But we're looking Pat, Pat, Pat has spent a lot of time looking and just hasn't given up yet. He's the only one who says any first line out of another fair ten species gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have um, some comments and a question yeah. online. April said, did a great talk. Thanks, Nick. I think decision makers in the southern half of the continent really have little idea how little we have about species in the northern half. Yeah. And um, Claire said, writing recovery plans. I quickly realised there's a real lack of documented fundamental knowledge on natural history for most Australian threatened species. I have some thoughts on why not, but how to fix? Um, yeah, I do. And this, might, this might be a bit controversial, but I think we rely heavily on expert knowledge for this and going back to what I said before I think a lot of that expert knowledge is you know it might so the night parrots are a, are a perfect example everyone whenever anyone has a question about night parrots they can't ask me and I'm like I know, it's a I know more than most people do about night parrots but I'm by no stretch an expert but it's, it's, it's what we've got so it's what they go with it's, you know, it's what gets written into plans and, and so I think there's a risk for a lot of species that a lot of our knowledge is comes from, you know, like I said, a few individuals working, not always, but sometimes in a relatively small area. And that, you know, like I said, anchoring, group think, you know, that, you know, all the people that become expert on night parrots have probably, you know, talked to me about night parrots. And I've probably influenced them about what I think. So it's not, you actually don't have these in really good independent assessments. And that's one of the things that, um, so James and I are working on this at the moment. Like, is there a way we can, that the ex I, I don't want to, I want to be really clear. I'm not discounting that expert knowledge. I'm not saying it's worthless. I, I, it's really important because it's all we've got, but we've just got to be careful about how we use it and how what sort of frameworks can we how can we incorporate it into a framework that gives us the right answers, or not the right answer, but gives us better answers, better, better answers, I suppose. That might be a little point in the answer to the question, but I think I'm going to another comment and a question from James as well. They said the strong territoriality of some male birders is a big contributor to the issues that you've raised. Yeah, it is. Have any women been given the opportunity to see them? Um, a few. Yes, actually, I don't want to say it's a few, but it's nice. It's bit, you know. um, the thing about the territoriality of birders is, is a really good one. So, and I don't mean in the sense that I think the point that Claire was it was. Okay. was making there is that you know one of the problems with buffy is that there was a couple of bloke blokes who had the sort of ownership of this area like no we this is where buffy is you come and see it and we tell you where to go see it sort of thing and pat and it started working with those guys initially but then it took you know they didn't like being told we actually think it might be shit. <laughs> <laughs> but the whether it's um the thing that that's territory that's one sort of territoriality. The other problem with territoriality is, as I often say, birders are more site faithful than birds. So <laughs> if you want to if you want to go and see a buff breast bun quail, I guarantee of the 30 people that claim to have seen buff breast and bun quail, 25 of them park their car within five meters of a particular spot <laughs> and went and walked this this way in and walked along this hill. They all saw it at the same spot. They all go to the same place. No one looks in other in other areas to find out if it might be there because a lot of the times, unfortunately, they're just interested in ticking off their list. They don't care about the population as a whole. Thing. That's and that's where all of our a lot of our bird not all of a lot of our birding information is born out of that. You know, that, that's where it comes from. This idea to you know to see things and add to your list rather than broadly understand the distribution of the species, which, as we know as scientists, requires you know sam you know proper sampling approaches and all these things, which are just not which are just not part of the birding world. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Your, your passion is really contagious. <laughs> Great spokesperson for these species. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how you ended up working with Rio Tinto and how that went and how that partnership kind of works. Yeah, it's a good question. It's not one without controversy yeah. because it's, uh, you know, because they, you know, their the project, I should be careful because it's not my project and Chris McColl, the PhD student, I want to be really careful, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but my experience working on the project has been a great partner. So, and the risk is you say, oh, well, we can't work with them because that's just what they do, but if it wasn't for them, this research wouldn't happen. That's just a place, you know, we wouldn't 
know who South Africa lost or who we didn't know them. They've never been, you know, they've never restricted what we can say about the project. We've never, been, you know, we've never had, you know, they had some influence in the project in the sense, you know, where we get to do some other work. But they've been really, and the NICAP research, actually, the initial funding for NICAP research came from Fortescue Bells as an environmental condition. And in, I'm there to two that's on the most of the roof, and I have had no problems with any of them in the sense that you would expect to maybe have a problem. So yeah, I'm just happy to be very violent with their involvement in both projects. I still do. So um, Fortescue Metals had to pay the, the, the million dollars they had to provide as an environmental offset that support the initial two years of environmental research, research on the night parrot. Um, they they still do so I, I still do some consulting with Fortescue Metals about night parrot work on their in their sort of area of country with the that they don't have to do, but they just they're just interested in that they still want to do it. So yeah, that's yeah, they have to be part of the work and a lot of the knowledge we have, you know, like as I said, same the red red boss we couldn't have got without it. Yeah. Uh, I was just interested in your statement about the birders being competitive uh, with yep. the lists and things. I'm working with uh, game fishermen. Um, yep. and citizen science, trying to get them involved in citizen science research on yep. bill fish, and so I see a little bit of a parallel with yep. the birding and that there's that competitive aspect, but then also they're quite interested in finding out more about the species. I'm just wondering if you yep. work with um, them, you mentioned the indigenous ranges, but also with, with bird watchers in terms yep. of engaging them with survey yeah. techniques. It's, it, it's, it's a challenge, so yeah. <laughs> With all this survey stuff, one of the degrees is funding. So you've got to, you know, if you want them to get it, all these birds we're talking about are going remote areas. So, you know, funding to get them out there, it can be difficult. It seems like some species just seem to work really well. So we've got a, um, one of our students, Henry Stosa, was working on parliamentary grass friend, and the foundation is, most of his data has come from a sort of citizen science program that's focused on that species. So that's different to information that's just collected generally. That, so that there's good, yeah, for that information is good quality control, mm -hmm. which, is, which is really important. Whereas for, when you're trying to collect some information in general, you know, generally that's where the quality control is where it can sort of fall down. So it's, yeah, it's, it's sort of a thing, I think it's a, and again, with going back to the protection, it's, it's a it's sort of an approach you maybe have to apply and spoke to every different circumstance. Would be sort of wanting to give any advice on how on how to incorporate citizen science. I mean, there's some things you can use citizen science for, and I'm sort of still the rules are starting to hear a bit, but you know, magpie with a million records across the country. Yeah, that that's a species where we can probably be pretty confident using that that data because there's so much of it and we can see the trends in it. Cox and Speech are only four, you know, record ones across the country. You know, obviously you can't use the science data that's so you have to find that there's a balance to be had there between the species, what sort of data you have from them, and what you're trying to work out, and whether you can just use general citizen science data, and when you have to that's a quite a spoken approach to what you need to be so your question. Yeah, it does. And I find that as well, yeah. you kind of need to have invested yeah. in that engagement specifically. Yeah. <laughs> I guess in my case, Bill Fish to get yeah. those outcomes. Yeah. And hopefully there'll be a paper or two to say yeah, yeah. well at all. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, James and Diana have had some comments about um taking up you know, his idea about um museum data. James says with museum data, just wondering, oh, here he is. He can, Hey, how you doing? Great, great talk, Nick. Um, yeah, I, I really like Hugh's idea and Diana's paper. I remember it's a fantastic piece of work. I just don't, yeah, and this is probably off topic, but how do you overcome the issue that museum rate collections are going down massively? You know, the sensitivities of collecting species and birds now. So, how do you pick up a signal? Because my worry is, you know, like um, for things like Coxon's fig parrot and Buffy and stuff like that, there was a lot of effort in the past um and you know and there's a stunning number of coxswains fig parrots for example in the queensland museum but how much shooting and how much collections has happened in the last say 30 years is is how do you pull out that signal of um rate potential rate of extinction just that's just a curious question love to hear some thoughts on 
I've got no idea. I suppose the, the, I, you could look at things that are maybe comparable to music. This is just a good show my head. You could look at things that may be comparable to music, like things like banding records. So, you know, a bird that's banded is caught and in the hand, and I think you'd be I think you'd be fairly well served accepting a record of a band of bird as a band of bird. Oh, I think that's supposed to be the African strawberry that they don't have. But um, so yeah, well, I mean, I, is there can you substitute things for, for museum knowledge? I don't know. But you, you're right, the, the, the methods and the styles of collecting change over time. And it goes a bit to what you were talking about, Hubert. It, why they're so difficult to work with these databases, because there are so many, there's so many variables, so many inconsistencies in not just What's being collected, but how it's being collected in you know spatial bias, like all these, there's all these biases existing in this database that we can't go into. So, so the take home message is go somewhere if nobody's ever been before and shoot stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. use the word, use the word. I oh, know, do you have an idea? Yeah, I was about to agree. Yeah, um, there are ways to to put effort as a as a variable in your analyses and try to. See if it explains everything. There's different ways to quantify effort, and museum collection rate of other things can um, tell you how the collection rates change. So museums take a lot of uh, things that have been hit by cars and stuff nowadays. Not so much that they've gone out and got them in Australia anyway. Maybe in some places where there's no collections at all, they they will collect them. But uh, yeah, you do have to take that into account. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a really good point, Diana. And I think, yeah, I forgot about that collection roadkill. Also, Nick, I really like the idea of you know, supplementing it with, you know, citizen science, bird, you know, um, birding efforts. Yeah, it goes back to that bigger issue that you mentioned, Nick. Though these, there's, there's enough birders in Australia who are stringy that to pull out this message is quite hard. And just frankly, for everyone listening, we we cop a lot of grief in rares when we try and explore this kind of stuff because people especially citizen birders, um, even scientists, don't want to hear the fact that they may have got it wrong. So, and that's been inter socially quite interesting to try and explore. And Nick, I don't know if you want to comment on that a bit more about some of the things that we've experienced. Well, no, I mean, I think I have sort of, you know, the question before about like territoriality of birders, that sort of thing, like telling people who, telling people who think they own a patch or whatever, that <laughs> yeah, maybe you don't know your patch as well as you thought you did. Because, you know, it's like, uh, you know, who, who, I get it. If someone told me that, you know, my, you know, in my area of research, I think you're wrong. I get, you know, I get a bit annoyed at too, and I'd be, I'd probably, you know, that's I guess that's how to be a good scientist though is to keep an open mind. And some of these people clearly don't have open minds. They they're interested in not being wrong rather than working out what the, you know, what what is the explanation? Why have you? Why has Pat not found buckies despite looking? You know, spending three years searching the site where everyone saw them up until the year before he started looking at them. You know? Like these are the sort of they're, they're sort of questions that I'm it's just really hard to answer. Um, and, you know, it's still a social science project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Angry yeah. birds. We'll take them on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bird. I'm firing myself with this brush. Anyway. Anyway. Anyone else? Yeah. Is there any captive reading program? Is that practical? Would it be? Uh, Nightbrat's a really good example of a bird that I reckon captive reading is just about the worst thing to do. So the, the um, I look, I'm, this is, uh, I'm very much boring what you think here. The comics of captive reading is what's the comics of myself. But the, what, the thing with captive reading, I like, is that it works for species where you know what the threats are, you manage the threats, you get rid of the threats, you put the thing in, and it does well. In Australia, in Arab Australia, that can happen if they like have a fence reserve. In New Zealand, it can happen if you have an island and the species can go off the island. So there's really specific circumstances where it works really well. There are other species like you know, orange belly parrot. There's a sound argument that orange belly parrot would be extinct now that wasn't protected for you. But I argue that what the captive breeding did was just keep its nostril above water and so we're starting with the my sense of that approach, they're starting to get better results now that they have the threats don't be managing well and probably they're starting to grow. The captive breeding kept that species in existence for long enough to do that work. But with night parrots, 
they occur over a really wide area. We know from the tracking an individual bird that you know, it used to vary about 5,000 hectares over the course of a, um, over the course of about three or four or five nights. Um, you know, you would how much area would you have to fence to keep a night parrot within it, you know, and we we know that the night parrot, we thought the night parrots were this thing, but we couldn't track on them and worked out that they were doing this thing. What's to say we don't track another couple of night parrots and work out they're doing this other thing again, you know, so. We can't we can't manage the threats at the scale we need to make captive free work. We can't make a you know, we can't make a fence that's big enough to contain a you know a sustainable population of night parrots. It's yeah, there's all these reasons why night parrots particularly are not a very probably not a very good case. But you know captive breeding is not going to be a way we solve the night parrot problem. But I don't want to reject it as a way of potentially, same as with the orange bill parrot, it might be a way to just keep the species, you know, ticking over for them after that, you know, that sort of later on. Although, the, I mean, and this is this is what's come out of the indigenous ranger work, is that we're finding that the eye parrots are relatively widespread, but everywhere we find them are super low density. So you're talking about, you know, like a few handful of birds in an area of, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of hectares. So we know that. So we're not saying that this works showing that oh, there's actually thousands of night crows out there we didn't know about. We think they're still really low numbers, but um, but we're slightly more comfortable that they're you know that there are enough populations that we have a bit more time to not have to worry about you know breaking the glass sort of thing, which is what happy breeding is. Let's get on to twelve o'clock. I'm sure other people got things to do. I'll stay here and bang on a birds all day. Be a bit more safe, <laughs> otherwise, there's no more. I was just thinking about the indigenous rangers that you're working with. You mentioned a lot about the museum historic records, but have you um, incorporated any traditional knowledge of the history? Yeah, so again, it's a indigenous knowledge. Um, if anyone needs to go, you'll be like, this is a bit fun. If you're interested, I'll talk about it because it's been one of the really interesting things that I've found in this project. Indigenous ecological knowledge, knowledge is um, it's there and it's there in different forms, but it can be really hard to get to. So, um, so the idea that you can just rock up to a community and talk to people and they'll tell you stuff—that's not how it works. So, with it's taken us, it's taken me about five years of working with the different indigenous communities that I work with. To be to establish the relationships that you need with them, then to feel comfortable with the amount of information with us. Having established those relationships, though, they, there is some stuff that they share. And it's interesting that about night parrots is really interesting. The really old people still remember night parrots and they still have in some of the areas they work and work and they still have value for it. So the couple of the old um, fellows from the Kumbu area called it, I think it's Nanaji, they call it. And they knew, they said, yeah, we know that one, you know, old spin effects, no fire, and that's right, then that's where you find out. So the knowledge is right. There's some risk, I think, with when the knowledge is so old that it gets sort of, I wouldn't say mixed up, but gets, it's it sort of, uh, there's not these clear lines of knowledge that you can trace right back and be confident that, oh, that's what they're talking about. Because they talk about, for example, the call of the night matter, the good story they tell is that, uh, we played the call of my parents. Some of the old ladies said, Oh, yeah, we heard that call. Our parents used to tell us that that was uh, a wanya, which is uh, like a spirit. And I know oh, that's a cool story. That's just a way of getting your kids to you know, wander off the camp. <laughs> so, but so we don't know are they actually talking about my parrot or are they talking about just a, a bird that they hear at night? That you know, curlews or other cuckoos, which call at night and sound like night parrots. We don't know whether that's specific night parrot knowledge. It could be, but it could be, you know, it's probably just probably more general. But there is definitely some knowledge about that, that's a long way back of, um, you know, that they do not night parrots specifically. But the thing where the indigenous knowledge has been really key is I would love to have the time to have, you know, 100 ARUs in the back of my truck and just spend two years driving around Western Australia, finding habitat and putting them out and finding night parrots. But I can't do that. The best way to do it is to go and do what we've done with the Indigenous Rangers, which is train them. So, yeah, here's this machine, this is how you work it, this is what night parrots do, they call, this is the habitat they like. Now, you guys know you're, they, they might still not, they might know some, might not know some of the old species, but they still know their country. 
and say so this is where you, this is what you look for and they're like straight away you see it they're like they draw a map and they go oh yeah we're going to go over here this place here that yeah that's over there and this habitat there's down there too off they go they put them out and back right so they know the it's not the, the knowledge that's useful is not necessarily the specific night parrot knowledge it's the general knowledge they have their country and it's that really like i said this has been easily the most rewarding thing for me in my project has been you know using that western science you know sort of techniques i suppose to, to develop the knowledge but then being able to transfer it to them to them being able to transfer back to me what they know about their country and i learn from them because they say you know in this area where we find them, this is what the other sort of you know features are so that helps me learn where the night parts are in their country and we sort of like set it together where we're solving the problem that's been uh, so yeah that's that's how people are indigenously a lot of ontological knowledge has been really helpful for this specific right now.